Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Vasco Rutusan Masterclass. Uh, before we start our lecture, um, I just would like to announce our uh, save the date for our next uh, Vasco Rutusan uh, Masterclass conference, which will take place in Houston uh, Methodist Hospital. Uh, if any special circumstances, we make it virtual. Uh, also, I want to announce that make sure you know that uh, all year around uh, we uh, have an RPVI uh, interpretation class when you're able to do the 500 interpretation you need for your RPVI. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, waveforms. Waveform don't lie. And uh, this uh, special uh, quote is coming from uh, Dr. Spencer. The Doppler waveform never lies. It's our own inability to understand its language. That's the problem. So uh, today uh, we are going to switch from English to uh, Doppler language. We're not going to talk about velocities, but we talk about the shape of the waveforms. And why I was preparing for uh, today's lecture, uh, one of I found a really interesting uh, publication, one of my friend's book. And what I would like to point out that this is a innominate uh, earth occlusion and ECA, ICA, CCA, all of them is reversed marked as retrograde. So what I want you to see is that when you see retrograde ECA, retrograde CCA, retrograde ICA, I want you to think about it. Does it make sense? What uh, the publication definitely says, all three vessels were retrograde. And I think it's uh, important that when you look at these waveforms, waveform numbers, uh, don't pay attention to velocities because they are all normal but very important that the flow direction. So when you look at the direction, one negative for ICA, positive for ECA, so negative for CCA. So first you need to really see the direction of the flow and look at these waveform shapes and you need to determine which is the low resistance waveform. The low resistance still in the middle tells you that is what's going to the brain and this is why it's positive. So we just would like to correct our friend's uh, publication and make sure that they understand that all the three ICA, ECA, and CCA cannot go reverse. And uh, we have a quiz. So where is this stenosis? Uh, this is my image. Uh, uh, one of my sonographers captured about a month ago. And this is your information. Stare this image. Uh, uh, first person who text the good answer, going to have a free registration on our vascular, ultra, vascular ultrasound masterclass. I know it's not easy, but this is the motivation. I want you two guys to understand when you see a waveform like that, don't be scared, study, look at all the details of the image that this is a right proximal CCA waveform. You need to question, is this arterial, is this venous? Look at the blood pressure information and please, uh, send us the good answer. Well, I would like to introduce my good friend, uh, Joseph Noam. Uh, um, he recently joined us and he is a vascular surgeon trained uh, here in Houston. And presently he's a medical director for the uh, vascular sur uh, surgery service line in Houston Methodist Clear Lake Hospital. Uh, his training uh, is very dangerous because engineering was before the math school, so I think uh, he knows everything about ultrasound physics as well. And after his engineering the medical school in Vanderbilt, uh, the surgical residency in Galveston, and a fellowship with Bayer College of Medicine with Dr. Lumsden. After uh, board certification, uh, uh, he went to the American uh, University Hospital, and now he is working with us. Joe? Please uh, teach us about the waveforms. Zol, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's really great to be uh, here again and here at the studio. So we want to thank everybody who is uh, joining uh, today. And uh, good afternoon to those in the US and those internationally. Either it's either good morning or good evening uh, to you all. So thanks for joining and hope you enjoy this uh, our lectures. And if you have any feedback or input, or you want to, uh, uh, us to cover other topics, please let us know. As I'm giving the lecture, I'm going to be looking slightly down my computer so I can look at some of the details of the waveforms. So the most important thing is, one of the things we want to talk about is waveforms today. We're going to sort of not talk a lot about the numbers per se, because to me the numbers are meaningless without the context of the waveform. 
And what we're going to see a lot is repetition, 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 just like it's stated in the title. The more waveforms we see, the various types of waveforms with similar pathology, the more we're going to be able to understand, or the better we're going to be able to understand the, uh, the different, uh, uh, the meaning of those waveforms. So uh, we're going to start from easy and start going to sort of more complicated. So first of all, when we look at a waveform, we need to see, when we look at a vessel, we need to be able to identify that vessel and kind of figure out how do we ID it and how do we interpret what we're seeing. So our first vessel here uh, is just the, the common carotid. There's the common carotid bifurcation. There's the internal carotid here and there's the external carotid. And as the arrow points out, the external carotid is the vessel that's going to have the uh, branches. The internal carotid doesn't have a branch per se, the, uh, at least in the extracranial secretion and the neck. Uh, one of the important things to note here is that we start seeing some sort of diastolic slow flow within uh, the, the, um, the bulb and that's sort of at the wide segment of a bulb we see some reversal diastolic flow within the uh, bulb area. If we want to dissect this a little bit more you see the normal carotid flow. There's the internal carotid, uh, internal jugular artery here and you see sort of the forward flow within the bulb. Okay. And within this widened bulb, we're going to see the, uh, the reversal uh, in diastolic flow, which appears as uh, blue. And, and this essentially represents a boundary separation uh, between the uh, 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 helical blood flow and the forward flow that's occurring within the uh, bulb area within the carotid. So we've, we've gone past the common carotid, we've uh, we talked about the bulb, now we have to figure out, you know, where's the money shot? The money shot is going to be trying to determine which one is the external and which one is the internal carotid artery. So we talked about looking at the branches, identifying the branches will give us a clue of where the ex which vessel is going to be the external carotid. Something else that we can do is a temporal tap. So uh, as we have the probe and longitudinal view, um, within the, over the carotid, we can tap over the temporal artery and you have to have the, pro the probe held gently and you tap, you're going to see, as we see here, especially within the diastolic component of the flow, the reverberations from the tap in the temporal artery, okay? However, you have to be cautious because if you tap too hard, you may see also those reverberations within the um, internal carotid artery, okay? Uh, another word of caution is if you're holding the probe too tight and your hand is sort of jumping up and down as you're holding the probe, that can potentially give you some artifacts and can mislead you into believing that what you're looking at is the external carotid artery. And here's another example. There's a temporal tap and you see sort of the reverberations within the um, uh, diastolic segment of the um, uh, external carotid artery uh, waveform. Uh, it's hard to notice it within the systolic segment because the, the velocities are a little bit higher, they're much higher than those uh, uh, that we obtain with a tap. Again, another wor word of caution. You know, these waveforms look quite similar. This is temporal tap, as we see it in the external carotid artery, and now we see these peaks. Well, this is pulses bifurians, and this is present either aortic stenosis with or without regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. We're going to talk more about this uh, later on today. But again, you have to really identify the waveform. And remember, temporal tap, you're going to notice it within the diastolic component of the external carotid artery. Another thing we need to do is optimize our imaging, right? As we see here, you know, there's flow uh, going through the internal carotid artery and the bulb is sitting right here. And now you see sort of this reversal of diastolic flow. Well, it's actually not that. If you look at the uh, color gradient here, you know, the velocities are set too low. So we're going to have to open up that window to at least 30, 36, or 40 to be able to really get a more accurate direction of flow. Uh, and what we're seeing here is essentially aliasing, okay? So this is not reversal of flow, but this is actually aliasing that we're seeing. Now what happens when we have a tortuous carotid, right? You see here there's a nice tortuous common carotid artery makes almost like an S shape, okay? Well, what do we see here? There's flow going in one direction and flow going the opposite direction. Well, that's just color. And what this re does is reflects the direction of blood flow relative, again, relative to the Doppler angle of incidence, relative to your transducer. So this is not blood going in one direction, the opposite direction, it's just flowing uh, anagrade towards the, the brain, but this is you know, facing one direction of the transducer and this is going sort of uh, towards the transducer and this is sort of going away or vice versa, okay? Depending on how you have your transducer held. So what do we do with a tortuous vessel? Where do we measure? 
Well, there's several options. The, the, the most important concept here is that you need to take your measurement parallel to the direction of flow and parallel to the uh, 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 walls of the artery. So as you see here, this is sort of almost parallel to the wall of the artery. The problem is the artery is taking a bend right there. So you're going to have some turbulence. So you're going to have uh, some artifact when you're measuring your waveforms. Well, if you measure with the transducer and the angle is in, uh, of incidence is this way, well, what's happening is you're almost perpendicular to the wall. You're going to get a completely different measurement. You know, this is probably the better measurement where you're getting almost the, as much as possible a straighter segment of, uh, of, uh, uh, of artery and, and you're, you're, you're measuring within the uh, parallel to the direction of flow. So your sample box should not be placed in a tortuous segment. And, and this is one of those examples where we're getting the measurement at the most accurate spot that we can. Here's another example, right? Here we have a measurement uh, in a segment where it's parallel to the vessel wall. Okay, there's no bends, no kinks, okay? This is right at the bend. This is really not parallel to the vessel wall. And here, well, we see that that's parallel to the vessel wall, but you're sort of almost, your imaging is, you're, you're, you're sampling uh, segments almost perpendicular too. So this is not gonna give you a very accurate measurement. So you have to try to aim for something like this on a tortuous vessel. The, the smaller the, the, the bend or the tortuosity, the tighter it is, uh, the more uh, difficult or the harder it is to obtain that uh, accurate measurement. But you have to be aware of that because you have to know that there's gonna be some artifact somewhere in that measurement. So now that we've talked about this, let's talk about normal. What is normal? And the goal about looking at normal is normal for a vessel within its context, depending on where the velocity is. So as we progress through the carotid arteries, normal is gonna be different for common, for external, for the bulb, and for internal. And we have to be able to, at a glance, know which vessel or which waveform corresponds to which vessel. So we see, here we see the common carotid artery. We, we look at the waveform and notice how it's slightly different from the uh, waveform of the bulb. The ex internal carotid artery is certainly different from all of those. In the external carotid artery, it's a little more different. We're gonna dissect and talk about each single one of them. So let's look at the common carotid artery. This is a mixed waveform. It has components of high resistance and low resistance, almost like a blend. Why? Because it supplies the internal carotid artery, which is a low resistance body, supplies the brain, and the external carotid artery, which is a high resistance body, essentially supplies uh, you know, the, the neck and the upper part, uh, and, and, and sorry, and the face. So uh, what we see here is there's a brisk systolic upstroke, okay? There's forward anti-grade flow, and there, there's a diastolic component, and there's not a lot of spectral broadening that we see here, okay? And the diastolic component certainly remains almost in its entirety above the baseline. So this is a waveform of the bulb. What we see here that you start seeing some spectral broadening because right now, once you're at the bulb, you're gonna have this sort of mixed resistance stuff. Stuff that's going, waveforms or uh, flow that's going to, towards the external and waveforms are going towards the internal artery. And, and here you also may see some of that reversal diastolic flow that we had mentioned earlier. You can see that reversal flow there right at the bulb. Uh, and we've already kind of uh, pointed at uh, what that looks like. Look at the external carotid artery. This is a high resistance waveform. There's a quick peak in, uh, peak or a very brisk peak systolic flow, okay? And the diastolic component usually in the, well, in a normal uh, instance or usually, in the external carotid artery is going to be much less than that in the internal carotid artery. So those are other clues. And as you see here, there's a pris brisk systolic component, anti-grade systolic, uh, uh, anti flow, and then you have a diastolic component, and sometimes it may just go directly down to zero. Contrast that to the internal carotid artery, where your brisk systolic upstroke is not as sort of brisk or perpendicular as that you, that you see in the external carotid, and the diastolic component really doesn't go to zero. Okay, if it goes to zero, now you're thinking about, hmm, there's some pathological problem. We're going to discuss those things. And you see the spectral broadening. And what I, when I see the spectral broadening sort of in layman's terms, how can we put it just to understand it easy? Well, you see this sort of filling of waveform colors within the spectrum that you don't see here. This is sort of, there's no, not significant color there. So if you want to think about it in simple terms, you know, the waveform is... You, you haven't color, when you have spectral broadening, you're coloring also in the lines, in, within the framework of that waveform. So let's, let's have some more examples. Again, 
high resistance, okay? And uh, this is a high resistance waveform. Brisk systolic upstroke, return to baseline, and there's a very small diastolic component. Compared to a low resistance waveform that you see here, this low resistance waveform uh, does not reach zero uh, in its diastolic component, and there's certainly spectral broadening. And again, understanding the flow or the waveforms in the carotid, I think if you can understand this easily, you can translate this to all other systems or all other imaging in the body, okay? And I think an important concept is what's high resistance and what's low resistance. And I want you to pay attention here because I've mixed in the slides the whether external or internal carotid, they're always not in order because I want your brain, your mind to start trying to think and pick these up. And I've given you classic standard examples and waveforms that look a little bit different. So these waveforms look very similar, right? But you see that there's a high resistance here because we're going down to zero baseline in the diastolic component. And the internal carotid here, we're not going down to zero baseline and they see the spectral broadening. And I, I hope you can uh, see the difference. And here what I want to highlight is how the spectral broadening gives you some clues about high and low resistance, okay? Here's another example. Now I have the ICA as the first example. There's a low resistance component. There is not a relatively brisk systolic component, but not quite uh, great. And the uh, systolic sort of peak is sort of slightly broad compared to a very brisk systolic component, okay, a return to baseline almost quick, and then you have a diastolic component here that is lower than that in the internal carotid. So we know that this is the external, and this is here the internal carotid. Again, look at the waveforms here. Diastolic, look at that diastolic component, look at that spectral broadening, okay, and look here, there's a little bit of turbulence here, and there's a high resistance here. You see, there's very little diastolic component. So what we're seeing here is uh, a high resistance external carotid artery. So how do these waveforms, again, now that we have these concepts, how do these waveforms progress? This is the mid-common carotid artery, okay? Sort of a mixed waveform. There's a little bit high resistance uh, in the, sort of in this case, the, the mid-common carotid compared to the uh, distal common carotid. As we're getting down to the bulb, you see how the diastolic component is starting to increase a little bit, you know, a little bit more uh, lower resistance because now we're getting a little bit more of that outflow internal carotid artery, okay? In this case, we see the external carotid artery. There is a long, uh, there's, there's a, uh, almost a zero diastolic component here. Brisk waveform, not a lot of spectral broadening, okay? Now we get here to the very proximal internal carotid artery. You see more spectral broadening. Uh, there's a slight increase in our diastolic component. And look at the internal carotid in the mid to distal portion. A lot of spectral broadening, very high uh, or higher compared to the other waveforms in that same patient, a much higher diastolic component uh, with spectral broadening. And that's a classic low resistance waveform. So here you've seen how the waveforms have progressed from the mid common carotid to the mid internal carotid uh, artery. Here's some more examples. Again, look at that baseline. The baseline, same patient, external carotid, diastolic component is low compared to the much higher diastolic component with spectral broadening and, and, and low resistance waveform in the internal carotid. So now we understand low and high resistance. Now let's start looking at some pathology, okay? So let's take a look. First of all, where do we measure? We have to measure the stenosis to get the highest peak systolic velocity at the level of, of the stenosis. So we take a measurement before, at, and after, because those kind of give you some ideas or clues of what's going on. But in order to calculate our ratios, okay, you have to really take the ratio at the highest point uh, of peak systolic velocity, and that's at the area of stenosis. So we identify the plaque, that's the stenosis, and that is where we have to take our measurement. It's right here not right there. So if you divide you know, this by the, by the pre, pre stenotic uh, velocity, you're not going to get a good result. This is just the, the post uh, stenotic measurement that we're doing. And you have to really try to find with color where that area of highest turbulence is at that segment to really get that calculation done. And again, proper interrogation is at the level of stenosis like we have done right there. And you see here that you know, there's an elevated peak systolic component, a very high end diastolic component. This remains, sorry, as a uh, low resistance waveform, but there's evidence of significant turbulence. What happens when we have a plaque? And this is where it gets a little tricky. Here what we see is a very calcific plaque, and what's causing is echogenic shadowing. In other words, the ultrasound cannot get through that plaque, and what you see is void. You don't see anything behind it. 
Well, you cannot take a velocity measurement at that point. So what you have to do is take your velocity before and after. And one of the rules of thumb, and there's an article already listed on this, uh, on this article that you may be able to look up, is if the segment is greater than two centimeters, that degree of stenosis really cannot be determined with accuracy. But the waveforms will give you a clue, and we're going to go through this. If this area of echogenic shadow is less than one centimeter, if you don't see any turbulent flow within that, uh, in the post stenotic segment, you can almost suggest or in a way guess that's more than a 50% stenosis at some point. There's something there. If, the dampened, if there's dampener and turbulent flow seen uh, distal to that, we can suspect that that's a very severe stenosis. And we're going to go through some examples here in a little bit. Okay? So here's some echogenic shadowing. We really can get a measurement there. And then we see here that there is uh, um, you know, not significant turbulence. The flow appears somewhat normal. But this may be able to give us an idea of kind of where we are. In this case, I don't think the stenosis is causing significant because the plaque is quite eccentric up here. You don't see a significant uh, component uh, within uh, the uh, true lumen of the internal carotid. Here, what do we have? This is a shelf-like stenosis, just a little very focal stenosis that you can see. It's almost like a, like a calcified valve in the venous system, right? So what we see is that we're measuring right at that stenosis. There are several things to look in this image. There's a lot of turbulent flow. We can potentially open up this window a little more so we can get less aliasing. But again, you see a lot of spectral broadening. Okay? You have very elevated uh, peak systolic velocity that's 403. And our end diastolic velocities are mm, about 200 or slightly less. So we know that that is a severe stenosis. What happens, you know, we talked about the post-stenotic dampening. Okay? So what do we see here? We see a lot of turbulent flow spectral broadening, a ele very elevated diastolic component, and diastolic component at 126, peak systolic velocity at 561 here. What happens distal to this area of stenosis? Look at the flow. This is a slow systolic rise, dampened flow, very low peak systolic velocity. We know that this stenosis is extremely severe. Forget about the numbers here. Let's say we don't see those numbers. But by looking at this very turbulent waveform with you know, a lot of spectral broadening and seeing this waveform, even if you didn't have these numbers to go by, you would know that between this waveform and that waveform, there's a significant stenosis that you should be looking at. And this is what the waveforms tell you. The waveforms are telling you a story. You just need to really pay attention to that story and come up with your conclusions, okay? Now, let's look at another area. Here's an area where, where the, almost a stenosis is missed, right? So you have sort of uh, the velocities here, the waveforms in the common carotid artery, and you see that there's some high resistance. Remember, the common carotid has to have a mixed waveform, but here you see that there's a sort of a high resistance uh, end diastolic component here, okay? And then as we're moving past the, uh, within the common carotid, you see that the waveform becomes a little bit more low resistance, but it's a little more dampened. The peak systolic rise is delayed, and there's sort of a curve to that peak systolic uh, 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 peak. Okay, what we see here is also a defect, so there's certainly a plaque here, but again, if we're going to make it, take a measurement, we have to really measure right where the cursor is and not below. But we know that between this proximal common carotid and this mid-common carotid, there's an area of stenosis, okay? And the waveform gives you clues. So what happens here? Well, here we're going to start going to, into more significant pathology. Here's a common carotid artery that's patent, and then here what we see is just an, a occluded internal carotid artery, and what we're feeling here is just probably the thump or the pounding uh, uh, of uh, or reverberation into that occluded segment. And that's a patient with a known chronic occlusion of the common carotid, uh, of the internal carotid artery. So what's next? Let's talk about what a string sign looks like. What we have here is the waveform within the uh, mid-common carotid artery. You see there's a peak systolic rise, and there's a little bit of a lower end diastolic component here. And now we're seeing a little bit more turbulence uh, as we're moving on. And there's some turbulence within the external carotid artery and some elevated velocity slightly. But look at that end diastolic component in the external carotid artery. What does it tell us? Well, that end diastolic component looks a lot, a lot like a lower resistance component. Again, this image could be optimized by opening up this window a little bit and, and the sampling and, and getting that color to be maybe 20 or 30 perhaps. But look at this internal carotid artery. You don't see any diastolic component. There's just this sort of systolic component of waveform that we see. What we see here is a brisk peak systolic peak, return to baseline, and almost a reversal, where, where the number two is. 
That's almost like a reversal of flow at the end of systole or the beginning of diastole, and there's hardly any diastolic component. So this is almost a string sign within the internal carotid artery. What do we have here? This is an example of a occluded common carotid artery, patent external carotid artery with reverse flow, low resistance. Why? Because it's flowing into the internal carotid artery, which is a low resistance component. It's going reverse flow towards the internal carotid artery. And the internal carotid artery has anti-grade flow to the brain with uh, some spectral broadening here and a, and a low resistance component. You see that? And there's an area of stenosis somewhere in there, and that's probably at the site where the plaque, because remember, a plaque that's located in the bulb, it's not just in the bulb, it's really uh, involving almost the origin of the internal and the external carotid artery, as we always see during surgery. It's very rare to see a, a plaque involving only the origin of the internal carotid artery and not somehow uh, uh, getting the external carotid artery to, to, um, to be involved too. Here's another example of occluded right common carotid artery. Again, retrograde external carotid artery flow and retrograde internal carotid artery. So you see a low resistance component of that external carotid artery that it's reversed. Why? Because it's going low resistance towards the internal carotid. And now you have this kind of nice, normal looking internal carotid waveform that's kind of being fed from the external carotid um, as we had discussed. Again, here are some more examples. Again, low resistance external carotid reverse flow. Why? Because it's flowing into the low resistance internal carotid. But look at that in, uh, internal carotid artery. The flow is low resistance, but there is some dampened peak systolic flow. So that tells you that there's a stenosis still at that origin. So maybe as you, know, as you see the external and the internal carotid, right at that origin of those two vessels, there might be a stenosis. And that's why the, f the peak sort of velocities here are dampened. Okay. Look at the numbers. You know, the, the peak systolic velocity is 33.9. There's a very delayed systolic rise, and then there's just a sort of almost emerged diastolic component of low resistance. So uh, very probably there's a stenosis right at that origin too. Here's a longitudinal view that we've reconstructed on the patient. There's a common carotid, the bulb in the external carotid, and those are open. But again here, what we see is common carotid open, bulb, and then the internal carotid artery is occluded. So let's see what happens there. Look at the progression of velocities. Here, you have the common carotid, that's patent, and then as you get to the bulb here, you see the high resistance velocity at the bulb, okay? Very high resistance velocity, why? Because you don't see hardly any diastolic component. And then, and this is right below the internal carotid, and then as we see the ECA, there's hardly any flow at, of the ECA right just above the bulb. So if, this, if the occlusion is right here, we're sampling just above it, okay? You see some of that little thumping here. You know, one may potentially even suggest that, well, is there a string sign or not? But this is a patient that, that has uh, um, uh, a, a, a string sign that we've confirmed on, uh, on a CT angiogram. And as you see, if you're able to really look closely, there is very little flow that we're able to detect with our probe. And, and, and again, if, if you're able to, to decrease that window from 40 megahertz to maybe, you know, uh, um, 10 or, or, or less potentially, you may be able to, to see a little bit more of that slower waveform uh, in, within the internal carotid, okay? Now, let's take a look at some uh, other waveforms here. This is the bulb. This is an occluded ICA. And this is right at that area of occlusion at the cusp, okay? you see the very high resistance. Peak systole, quick return to baseline right there. And one may say that there might be a, a early reversal of uh, systolic flow right at the beginning of systole here potentially, okay? Here's another patient. This is a patient with occluded right internal carotid artery. Well, let's take a look and see what happens between the right and the left. So remember, right occluded, carotid, uh, uh, right occluded um, internal carotid artery, sorry. So what we see here is the right internal carotid artery is occluded. What we do we expect in the common carotid? Well, there's going to be high it's going to be a high resistance waveform. Look, quick peak, very little diastolic component on the right side. On the left side, where the internal and the external are open, it's a little bit of a, of a uh, uh, lower resistance waveform. We're going to talk about this uh, in a second. Look at the external carotid artery. Because the internal carotid artery is occluded, the external carotid artery becomes this sort of dual artery and 
it has a little bit more of a low resistance looking waveform. The velocities are slightly elevated because it's trying to compensate for that occluded internal carotid on that same side, okay? And the, there's a little more spectral broadening, a little bit more obvious diastolic component, almost like a low resistance. Let's look at the left side. On the left side, because the right side internal is occluded, the left side is picking up the slack and there's increased uh, higher velocities, okay? and more low resistance because they're sort of taking up, picking up for that collateral flow that we're seeing from the left side to try to supply the right side. And this is sort of compensatory vasodilatation. This is one of those examples. Again, the external carotid also lower resistance here because the body is trying to compensate and the left side is trying to pick up that work that should be done by the now occluded right internal carotid artery. Now let's switch gears a little bit to the subclavian and the vertebral arteries. And what I like about these two arteries, especially the vertebral, is that vertebral gives us another different element to the story of what's happening in the brain. So we've, we know now what the difference between high resistance and low resistance waveforms. Well, we know that the subclavian artery supplies muscles of the arm, right? And that is a high resistance system. So what do we expect? High resistance waveform. Very little diastolic component, peak systolic rise, quick return to that, to, to, uh, of, um, quick return to baseline with a high resistance waveform. And again, this is one of those sort of, you know, uh, simple things to look at. The vertebral artery is supplying what? The brain. and doesn't have a lot of branches coming off until you get to the brain. So what do we see in the vertebral artery is a very low resistance waveform, classic low resistance waveform, okay? And this is something interesting. What you see is the vertebral artery. So you have the vertebral bodies and the vertebral artery going through, and you're going to have the echo shadowing from the vertebral bodies. So you have sort of, sort of packets of windows where you can examine or interrogate the vertebral artery. So let's start looking at pathologies. Okay, This is a patient with a 24 millimeter of mercury pressure difference between the right arm and the left arm. So it's much higher on the right arm. That tells us that there's probably a stenosis going on on the left. So let's look at the waveforms. You, know, you have a peak systolic rise, a return, and there's some diastolic component. And on the left side, there's hardly any diastolic component here, right? And you see it's almost reverse in a way. So the diastolic component is uh, at or below the baseline here. And that tells us that this is a higher resistance waveform compared to the right side. Well, what other clues can we get? Well, let's take a look. This is a low resistance vertebral. And this is also a low resistance vertebral, but look at both vertebrals. You know, they both have a sort of a dampening of the systolic rise, because remember, the velocities here on the right side, they're still elevated. So there's a component of stenosis on the right side, but on the left side, the stenosis are more severe. Why? Because there is a significant delay in the peak systolic rise on the left compared to the right side, and the velocities are a little bit more dampened on the left compared to the right side. So those give us a clue that this stenosis is actually uh, real. Not only that, but you see a lot of the spectral broadening that we see on the left and that we don't see as much of that on the right side. So again, bilateral subclavian stenosis, you have the vertebral. So if I were to ask you which one has it's more significant without knowing what the blood pressure difference is, you can easily tell that the left side is more significant than the right side. This, 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 uh, this vertebral is actually is fantastic because it gives us a lot of information. So this is a patient with vertebral uh, artery stenosis. You see the stenosis right there. When we sample before the stenosis, you see this sort of increased velocity over 200, spectral broadening, and a very low or non-significant or non-existent end diastolic component, right? That's a high resistance waveform. What happens when we sample past the area of stenosis, right? This was almost at the area of stenosis, right at the stenosis, and this is sampling past the area of stenosis. What do we see? There's a you know, a very dampened waveform, and also there is not a lot of diastolic components. So this also tells me that there still may be an outflow stenosis going to the brain, because what I would have expected here is a much greater diastolic component. If I don't see that, I know that there is still a vertebral steno outflow stenosis further up down the vertebral, okay? And that would probably require additional imaging to see what's going, up, going on up in the brain. This is a patient with a proximal subclavian artery stenosis, okay? With isolated subclavian artery, first of all, you see the waveform. It has some diastolic component, but look at that delayed peak systolic rise. There's a dampened waveform with rounding of the, systolic, uh, of the peak systolic waveform. 
and then you just see this sort of uh, uh, almost uh, seesaw up and down waveform, okay? And the peak systolic velocities are also decreased. Let's look at the vertebral, okay? Here's same patient, right and left vertebral artery. So let's look at the normal left vertebral artery. Peak systolic rise, return, a significant diastolic component, low, classic, classic low uh, resistance waveform. What happens on the right side? First of all, you look at the image. The vertebral is small, okay? Peak systolic rise and hardly any diastolic component, okay? This is almost like a staccato waveform, okay? And this is what we see usually in either an alpha stenosis or in ho almost a hypoplastic vertebral artery. I suspect that this patient may have also an alpha stenosis because you have this kind of very uh, classic or uh, uh, sort of staccato waveform where you hardly see any diastolic component, okay? Right to, to clavian artery stenosis in a patient with vertebral artery steel. What do we see here? Well, first of all, we gotta look at this. The velocities are high. There's a lot of spectral broadening. We see the window, window here could be opened up a little bit to get some of that turbulence, but where is the measurement? The measurement is right at the elbow, right at the elbow of that, sub, of that subclavian. So our measurement, there's a little bit more turbulence that we may potentially expect. Expect, I think if we were to measure it at a certain, a different area, we may get a little bit of, of that. So this may be an overestimation of the, of the peak systolic velocities and we may expect some turbulence because of where it was measured, right? So, uh, but what we see here is that the, there's spectral broadening and then we see that there's a return to baseline. That may give us a clue that there's a stenosis there on the known patient, but the measurement is not done in the exact right place. Then the question here is, does the patient have bilateral subclavian artery stenosis? Okay, here's a patient with res high resistance waveforms with minimal to no end diastolic component. And on the left side, you see that there is a wide and nice diastolic component. Well, what I didn't tell you here is that the patient has a arteriovenous fistula on the left side. And that's why you see this significant diastolic component because it's feeding an arm that has an arteriovenous fistula in the left upper arm and what that is doing is decreasing the resistance for that vessel so it's really hard to tell whether this is compensatory due to the AV fistula and that's why the velocities are high that's why this is turbulent but given the fact that you have a high a, a sort of a significant end diastolic component here you're thinking hmm, this might be just compensatory effects from the uh, uh, having the AV fistula on that arm causing the increased velocities, increased flow, and the significant diastolic component. Because to have this significant increased flow in the patient with stenosis, I would not have expected on this arm to see the uh, this end diastolic component of significance. It would look more like this, and this patient does have a stenosis on the right arm that's been confirmed, and you see hardly any diastolic component. Let's look at different vertebral pathologies. This is a great article. I think you, sh you all should read this. And this will kind of show you a progression of vertebral uh, artery waveforms with uh, more and more uh, or more significant subclavian artery stenosis leading to steel. We're going to give you some examples. So let's take a look. Again, we want to compare right and left, right? Look at the right uh, vertebral artery, peak systolic rise, sort of a slightly rounded uh, uh, systolic peak end diastolic component, low resistance. What happens on the left side? This is a patient with subclavian artery stenosis. Right at the early or mid-systolic area, there is a mid-systolic deceleration followed by anti-grade late systolic velocities. You see that little dip. Some people call this sort of rabbit-shaped waveforms. Well, you just look at that dip and you want to compare it and you're going to notice that that's a very early pre-steel waveform. Okay, this is setting a right common carotid artery occlusion. Watch the vertebral artery perform on the left side. So this patient has vertebral artery occlusion. And uh, what happens with this patient, a right common carotid artery occlusion, okay? So what's, what's happening? The vertebral is having some early, okay? Uh, um, this is ICA. Sorry, sorry, this is the ICA. So what ha what's happening in the ICA here is that you have a, a very early reversal in that, in that systolic, uh, in the peak systolic peak, so it's reversed, and then you get the anti-grade the, the uh, late systolic segment and uh, end diastolic segment. So you see flow almost going, almost wanting to go retrograde towards that uh, external carotid artery. And that is uh, on the right side. But look at the vertebral on the right side again, okay? 
peak, increase peak systolic velocities, okay, because the internal carotid is not doing its job. The flow should be integrating in the internal carotid, right, but it's not, right? So the vertebral, you see more spectral broadening, a very sort of significant di end diastolic component or diastolic waveforms, very high low, low resistance. The velocities are increased. So what the vertebral on the right side is compensating for the work that in the internal carotid should be doing because the internal carotid is almost letting the external carotid borrow some of that systolic flow, early systolic flow that we see. Look at that reversal, right? That's fantastic. Um, let's look at some more velocities here. So right subclavian artery, what do we see here? Delayed in peak systolic rise, okay, almost around the tip, and it's almost like a, a low resistance. So the right subclavian artery shows dampened waveforms, okay? What do we see in the right vertebral? Peak systolic rise, reversal in mid systole, and then anagrade flow in diastole. That is steel, okay? So what do we have? Do we have vertebral steel on the right side, and we have uh, dampened uh, subclavian artery velocities. Where is the lesion on the right side? It could be at the origin of subclavian or it could be at the innominate. Let's look at the carotid. The common carotid artery velocity on that side, uh, waveform, looks normal. It's almost like a mixed low resistance. It's fantastic. So we know here that the innominate is probably okay. The origin is, uh, the stenosis is right at the origin of the subclavian artery. That's why the subclavian artery are dampened. And by the time we get to the vertebrals here, the vertebral is giving, it's letting the subclavian borrow some of that systolic flow uh, leading to it. What happens on the left side? Look at the left side. Peak systolic waveforms, you know, high resistance diastolic component, not significantly high velocities, okay? And look at the vertebral on the left side. Normal vertebral artery, okay? So this is a patient with a origin of the right subclavian artery stenosis with sparing of the innominate because of the carotid waveforms are normal, okay? And with reversal of flow, in the uh, sort of uh, mid-systolic uh, uh, segment with anagrade diastolic flow. So let's take a look, right versus left vertebral pathology. Again, this is, um, you know, both vertebrals are of the same patient. Right vertebral origin stenosis. Why do we say that? Because look at that diastolic component. So it's a low resistance. So we know it's supplying the brain without problem. But what's getting into the vertebral? It's dampened flow, okay? And if this was a subclavian stenosis, we would suspect a little bit of reversal of flow or something like that, or that dip at the beginning of uh, early systole, okay? So this is a dampened waveform, the late systole upstroke and very rounded velocity. So there's a stenosis at the origin of the vertebral that we haven't picked up. That's on the right side. What happens on the left side? Well, on the left side, you see systole, a dip, in the early systole, and then a return of anti-grade flow within the systolic, uh, uh, the late systolic segment with sort of an anti-grade end diastolic component, low resistance. So what's happening? There's a subclavian artery stenosis. There's a little bit of uh, reversal of flow, so very early pristile. But at the same time, the vertebral is trying to do its job as much as possible to supply the brain with some anti-grade flow. Why? Because the right vertebral has a, has a stenosis at its origin. So you, you see what all this information, and we haven't even looked at the velocities, okay, much. So this, I think, it's what's happening, okay. One can also argue, and again, that, you know, look at the velocities here. Peak systolic flow is a little bit high. It's 100, right, uh, 118. So potentially, even though there's a stenosis there, you know, the vertebral is trying to do as much as possible also to help improve that flow, given that the opposite side has a little bit of steel. So both vertebras are almost vasodilating themselves to try to supply the brain with some flow. So this is a right vertebral artery. This is again pre-steel. You know, elevated systolic velocities in the subclavian artery, peak systolic waveforms with the disturbed flow uh, and high resistance uh, looking waveforms. And you see there's systole, boom, there's a big dip, dip in the uh, mid-systolic uh, waveform, almost to almost zero, okay? And then you see the diastolic uh, component, okay? And that's the right side. Compare that with the left side. So we know that on the right side there's evidence of steel as we compare this waveform with its counterpart on the left side. Left proximal vertebral artery stenosis. Again, look at the right side. Peak systolic uh, upstroke, almost brisk. And then you have a classic low resistance waveform. What happens on the left side? Okay very delayed waveform with a rounded peak 
and dampened waveform, very low peak systolic flow. So again, you look at the, at the picture, this may be a hypoplastic vertebral or a vertebral that has a significant stenosis at its origin, uh, uh, given the fact that there's still a diastolic low resistance component. So more steel waveforms, again, subclavian so artery on the right side, normal velocities, normal waveforms, also the vertebral on the right side. But we look at the subclavian on the left, turbulent, high resistance waveform, look at that vertebral. You have that reversal of flow in mid to late systole with return of anti-grade flow in diastole, okay? Again, positive for steel. Let's look at these both vertebrals. Again, I always like to look at the normal vertebral first because I want to establish my baseline. So you see a low resistance waveform, okay, with a rounded peak, so very low resistance here. What do we see on the right side? Peak systolic flow and return to baseline, hardly any diastolic component. This is almost like a staccato waveform, okay? So we know that there's an outflow stenosis within that right vertebral artery. This is a high resistance right vertebral artery, okay? Compared to the low normal resistance vertebral artery on the left side, okay? And again, high and low resistance. You see this, you know that it's stenosis at the outflow of this waveform, okay? And, and this waveform also applies to the lower extremities. You know, if you have a common femoral artery, superficial femoral artery, and then the superficial femoral artery occludes, well, that's what you're going to see right before the area of occlusion, okay? Again, the subclavian artery, and look at this artery. You have the, inner, um, the, the, internal, the, the internal mammary artery being uh, shown there. There's subclavian artery, okay, uh, that has some uh, high resistance component up here, okay? And what do we see here? You see a dip in mid uh, or to early systole and the return of anti-grade flow in diastole, okay? This is steel waveform. This, is, this waveform was done before stenting. Now look at the waveforms after stenting. There's decreased bro spectral broadening within the uh, uh, carotid. One thing is here, you don't see a lot of the diastolic component. And the reason for that is, look at this window, the color, 57, okay? So you're going to be missing on that diastolic component. If this, this, this sort of the color window was reduced to maybe 30, you may be able to see the slower flowing uh, or lower diastolic uh, uh, component within the waveform. But look at that vertebral. You don't even have to know whether the patient, what, what intervention had. All you have to know is that something happened between here and here, and you don't see any more that reversal of flow. So there's, uh, there's adequate flow to the subclavian, and we know that for sure based on this. Okay, based on the fact that the waveforms of the vertebral artery return to normal. Okay, now look at this again, another waveform steel, right subclavian, right vertebral, re entire reversal of the systolic component of the vertebral. Okay, and that's also consistent with steel. Again, let's take a look. Dampen waveforms. And the reason I keep repeating this is because it's important for us to really understand what the waveforms look like, what dampen waveforms look like. Not enough to give you one picture, one example, because you're not going to take a lot out of that. Okay? And what we see here is that this may potentially be suggestive of a proximal uh, uh, vertebral artery stenosis because of the dampening of the waveforms. Okay? Again, mid systolic deceleration and retrograde late, late systolic velocities in a patient with subclavian artery stenosis. What do we see here in this waveform? You know, we see almost two waveforms. You see the subclavian waveform, then you see some of that turbulence that we may be able to pick up. And some have suggested that uh, uh, that turbulence, as we see here, there's an end uh, where the, the, the yellow represents the end, uh, end acceleration velocity. And then you see the red that differs between the two is that traditional peak systolic peak that we peak. And the difference is all that turbulence that, we peak, that we're able to uh, obtain. And again, here's another example of a patient with complete reversal of the vertebral artery uh, as, as the, the stenosis within the subclavian artery is quite severe. Okay? Again, vertebral artery pathologies, delayed systolic uh, rise, suggestive again of a potential proximal right vertebral stenosis, potentially. But then on the left side, we know for sure that there is some evidence of, uh, of almost very early pre steel because of that dip in the vertebral, okay? And again, let vertebral steel, and we notice that compare the right to the left side, okay? And compare the velocities, subclavian velocities. On the right side, they're low. On the left side, they're increased. So there's a subclavian artery stenosis, and we can see that that's already starting to affect the, the vertebral artery. What do we see here? <laughs> 
patient with right subclavian artery stenosis. Okay? And we have to interpret this within the context. context. There's decreased uh, right vertebral upstroke, okay? Delayed with low resistance, okay? No outflow stenosis, okay? This looks almost like a normal waveform. What do we see on the left side? Left vertebral outflow stenosis. There's a high resistance vertebral waveform with a brisk systolic upstroke and no diastolic component, almost like a thump, or that staccato thump, okay? So we know that there's a significant stenosis in the outflow of the left vertebral uh, artery. This is a great case. This is a great case. I want you to start looking at that little fine print. You know, this is a patient who had a carotid ultrasound evaluation, and what we noticed that the uh, blood pressure, right brachial blood pressure was 179 systolic, and 104 was the systolic on the left side. So 75 millimeter of mercury difference between the right arm and the left arm. I said, great. Let's take a look and see where the lesion is. So we look at the right subclavian artery. Okay, the velocities are not significantly elevated. Okay. And now we look at the right vertebral artery. Look at that. The waveforms look okay. Nothing terrible. Okay. And, you know, low resistance waveforms, no dips or anything. Left subclavian artery. The measurement is done sort of not really parallel to the, fl to the flow. And that's probably what's giving us this sort of increased uh, 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 turbulent waveform. But the vertebral looks great. So there's no vertebral stenosis, no, no, no subclavian stenosis. The vertebral looks great. I would expect this stenosis to be severe. I was expecting to see a reverse flow in the vertebral artery, given the fact that the patient has a 70 milli 5 millimeter mercury pressure difference. And it wasn't a, a measurement error. That was the real blood pressure. That was confirmed. So where, the where is the stenosis? Well, we know that that stenosis is certainly not within the origin of the subclavian artery on the left side. And it's that certainly past the takeoff of the vertebral artery. So it could be in the, in the thoracic outflow segment, okay? Or it could be potentially uh, in the axillary artery or the brachial artery. That now, because I don't see a lot of diastolic component here, I'm finding a high resistance, so I'm, suspe I'm suspicious this potentially could be a stenosis within the, the subclavian artery at the outflow, probably in the thoracic outlet or so. So, so this is quite interesting. So by looking at the velocities, you can kind of almost estimate where the lesion is and where the lesion is going to be and what's going to be your next uh, 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 test. Let's take a look at carotid stents. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, carotid stents is going to be the next lecture. Fantastic. Uh, we are almost out of time. And uh, can we put back my question? Um, I also would like you to tax the good answer to DeBakey, uh, the word to the number 37607. I still haven't seen a good answer, so uh, I still would like to motivate you to stare at this uh, screen with me and try to come up with something that where is this stenosis. Um, basically, um, the why I wanted to uh, uh, take out the uh, potential venous waveform, because you do see a, a venous signal. Uh, if you guys see it here, so here's your venous signal. This is why it's definitely an arterial signal. Second reason, uh, your waveforms are quite similar. So is, you is don't see, um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are showing my screen, please. Uh, so you see a, a symmetrical uh, waveform. So you don't see a respiratory phasic mm -hmm. changes. So that would be excluding the venous. Yeah. So we're going back to uh, one of my favorite teaching point is, uh, as you mentioned, when you see a systolic upstroke between your measurement point and the heart, definitely there's no obstruction. Mm -hmm. That missing systolic upstroke kind of alerts you that there's definitely a stenosis between your measurement point and the heart. Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking, I need to go proximal. So I'm in a proximal right CCA, let's go proximal. And the good answer, what I was looking for, either in innominate uh, stenosis versus a uh, right proximal CCA stenosis. The blood pressure, I wanted to give a clue. So the blood pressure difference would give you a clue that why is this an innominate versus a, uh, uh, so we, uh, we received the first uh, uh, answer, and that is, again, what we are giving you a clue that this is not a brachiocephalic or innominate stenosis because your blood pressure difference pointing out that your left side blood pressure is lower. So if you have a brachiocephalic or 
uh, more proximal stenosis, then your right side blood pressure will be lower. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so crucial that each protocol we do, you need to have a bi bilateral of blood course. pressure done that with that one waveform, it tells you the whole story and then you can have all the build up and look at all the different images that why is where the stenosis is. So the good answer, what I was looking for is definitely a proximal CCA stenosis. Uh, I really appreciate the first uh, attempt and definitely I would like to give you a, a, a free uh, uh, registration, but uh, better luck next time. Uh, uh, please watching our teaching and what we are, would like to teach you is one of our key element to confirmation on this. What you see here is our flow volume. This is stunning. So flow volume in a mid CCA, we stole it from our AVF protocol. Mm -hmm. It's 100 cc on the right side. 450 cc on the left side, giving you not just the velocity, the waveform difference, and then I think it's very important how you said it's dampened. So for me, this has become more blunted, almost flat, mm -hmm. because you can't even see a systolic upstroke in that waveform, but the variation of the velocities. And I think my confirmation and, uh, was by, I wanted to show you the lower uh, velocity, uh, of blood, lower blood pressure on the left side, that we had a left subclavian disease. So despite that you have a disease on the right side, you can have a disease on the left side as well. Mm -hmm. So when you have one ultrasound finding, doesn't mean that it's a unilateral, so you can have some other disease by the left vertebral being reversed, and there's no biphasic component. So this is why I would call this is probably a left subclavian occlusion. And finally, uh, I would like to thank you guys uh, for your attention. I would like to thank Dr. Noam for the uh, superb lecture and also for our sonographers because I think your slides were so beautiful. I think there's sometimes you can, yeah, we can change the gain, change the angle. You can do some modification, but think about the workload, what these people need to, Absolutely. under the pressure, needs to perform. And we are expecting like a gorgeous waveform all the time. So each of these waveforms, and proudly we can show it on these lectures, it's really coming from a really high quality work. And this is where a special thanks to all our sonographers and uh, Houston Methodist System, because again, it's not just the hospital, but the also the outpatient clinic uh, samples. And you can see that these gorgeous slides are really coming from not 15 years ago, 10 years ago. These are really fresh uh, these are and beautiful. Fresh. <laughs> yes, and, and, and what we're trying to do is to gather as many of these sort of interesting findings and put them together because the best way to learn is by looking at all these slides, all these pictures and getting the experience that others can have. And, and, uh, and, and again, let's look at the waveforms, forget about the numbers, the waveforms don't lie. And waveforms will really tell you what's going on, okay? Yes, thank you so much. So remember, the waveform, the waveform don't lie. And remember, mark your calendar for the Vascular Ultrasound Masterclass, October 25th, 2020. And we just gonna do cases. So you need to review our last year protocols because in October, we only gonna do cases, 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 cases. Yep, thank we, you again. We have a lot more. Thank you, sir. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.